I'm David Weinberger. I'm a, uh, I'm a senior researcher at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Um, so there's clearly a ton that AI needs to learn from fairness. And Catherine, I think, did a, a fantastic job um, explaining, explaining this. Um, so I will go right over. I don't have to even talk about it. And, um, machine learning in particular, the sort of AI that people generally mean when they say AI these days. Uh, machine learning's original sin is, in fact, bias. It's the original sin because machine learning learns from data, and as Catherine explained, it's going to pick up on uh, the biases that are in the data. It can be extremely difficult to get rid of them. This is a huge, huge, huge problem that is thankfully getting a lot of attention. Um, it remains a really important problem. But it seems to me that there's also much that we can learn from machine learning about fairness. And in fact, we are already beginning to learn these lessons from our encounter with machine learning, uh, particularly uh, uh, you know, about fairness. Now, fairness is, seems like uh, a very simple idea and rather binary. Something's fair or it's not. And if I were to ask you to give an example of fairness or unfairness, there is an 83% chance that you will give an example of cookies. And that, that, by the way, is a fact. It's a completely made up fact, but it is a fact nonetheless. So your example would be uh, one kid gets two cookies, another kid gets three cookies or four cookies. That's unfair, unless, unless there is some relevant difference between them. So fairness has to do with the treating people in equal ways unless there's some good reason to differentiate among them. And for cookies, it might be that one kid is much bigger and older and the other who's getting the four, presumably. Or maybe the four uh, entered into a contract with you that if she or he did uh, some chore, cookies, more cookies would result. But something would be, if, there's, if, if that uh, disparity in cookies is to be fair, there's got to be some relevant difference. And that's a very simple, uh, simple uh, heuristic, a simple principle. Um, but it turns out it is incredibly difficult to apply. What counts as relevant? We argue about these things all the time. Who decides? We argue about these things all the time. Just last week, there was a suit against Harvard's admissions office um, that, was, that was settled in Harvard's favor. Doesn't matter. Um, which was a, a, a um, effectively an affirmative actions, affirmative action suit. Affirmative action in the U.S. started in 1961, and we are still arguing about it because we disagree, apparently, about what the relevant distinctions are, what the relevant differences are. So I'm going to give you an example. It's going to be, unfortunately, close to an example you heard earlier. Um, it's about a made, this one is about a made-up mortgage company called Acme. Uh, Acme um, in, is, its application pool consists, uh, again, it's hypothetical, I'm making everything up, is 30% women. And they are using machine learning, which I need to note, they are actually not allowed to do. It's uh, against all regulations, but my background is in academic philosopher, philosophy, so I am entitled, I am licensed, in fact, to, to shift reality in the way that I want. So let's just assume this mortgage company, I think that's how it works, right? So this, this mortgage company is using machine learning to sort applications into two piles, approved and rejected. 30% female applicants, the uh, approved pool is 5% female. And this, we hope, will cause some consternation at Acme. And the very first thing they're going to do is going to check their data to make sure that it's, it's not, uh, gender is not included. And in fact, that there are no proxies for gender included. This is, uh, you can do this well or poorly. But you cannot know that you did it perfectly, as far as I know anyway. But they make the genuine effort, and they think, no, it's, the problem's not in the data. They have this problem. So this, we hope, will now spark a conversation at Acme about what would constitute a solution to this. And so somebody is likely to say, well, look, all of the gender information that we could find has been taken out of the data. The data is gender blind, and therefore the outcome is gender blind, and so it's fair. And if it happens to be 5%, that's gender didn't figure. Somebody else is going to say, well, no, actually, if we have 30% female applicants, we should have 30% roughly in the, in the approved pool. And somebody else is going to say, well, that, yeah, OK, great. But 
what we really should be going for is demographic parity, 51% women, we should have 51% approved, if not higher, to account for uh, the, the history of pernicious bias in this field. And somebody else is going to say, uh, yeah, well, all that's fine, I, I respect what you're saying, but you're missing the point. What, we'll, what we really want, if this is going to be fair, what we really want is to make sure that the percentage of false positives for men and women in the approved pool is roughly the same. Uh, false positives in this case would be people who get approved who turn out to be deadbeats and don't pay back their loans. And if it turns out that you got a lot of, you know, 95% men, but there's a huge percentage of them, far, far higher than among the women, who don't pay back their loans, and that clearly there was some bias here. Uh, and somebody else is going to say, well, that's, I think you're on the right track there, but you also need to consider the percentage of false negatives, that is, people who should have gotten approved and didn't. And if there's, a, if the percentage of women who should have gotten approved but didn't, that's rank discrimination and really unfair. Now, my point certainly is not to settle this question. I have my opinions, but it doesn't matter. My point is, is first of two points, is that fairness is really complicated. We think it's a simple thing, and we talk about cookies, it's really, really complex. And the requirement that machine learning places on us to tell it what we count as fair puts a burden on us that brings us face to face with the complex, complicated nature of fairness about which we generally don't agree. Fairness is not simple, except if you're dealing with cookies and kids. And even then, it's not simple. So let's say Acme is a very public-spirited uh, company that's supposed to be a halo. I drew it myself. And they decide they're going to do something socially good. They, they don't want to have, only be giving mortgages to rich people, the lowest risk, richest people, because they would, like, uh, they would like to live in a society where you don't have to be super rich to get, you can actually uh, not be making all that much money and still be able to own a home. So they decide to play with some of the machine learning sliders, which are their tolerance for false negatives or positives for confidence. They can decide what percentage of the, of the how much money they want to give to, uh, to people of lower income who may, may thus be higher risk, maybe not, or what number of people from various economic classes they want to give. They have all of these sliders and, and things they can play with, which is, which is great. And they're going to argue about what they want to do, but they'll come to some conclusion, and they're going to give out the loans. And because I'm making this example up, they're now successfully, they, they, they're taking on a little more risk perhaps, but they're also enabling lower income people to own their homes. They, now they look back at the mix of the gender mix, and they may be back at 5%. Now, I, as I say, I'm making this up. Maybe it, would, maybe it would be 5% men. Doesn't matter. The point is they are going, I'm going to have to look over at Catherine again. They're going to have to make trade-offs. They're going to have to make, in this case, moral trade-offs about uh, are, would, are they willing to tolerate um, a disproportionate, lower disproportionate number of, say, women or any other protected class getting loans in order to achieve their social objective. I, again, don't know the answer to this but they are forced to see that fairness is not this binary thing. It's fair or it's not fair. It's, in fact, a matter of trade-offs, almost always. So in our session, we will very quickly, our, our example is going to, I'm sorry, our example is going to be um, trying to figure out what we want to optimize our company's robo-cars. We, we're a maker of autonomous vehicles, and we have to decide what values are going to be supported uh, by these, uh, excuse me, by these, um, car. So we're going to start off with a very quick uh, sort of context setting um, sense of uh, what the ethical theories that we might bring to this, the way that we think about, we in the, in the room, think about how to make moral decisions. Um, the bulk of the time, although it will go wherever you want it to go, the discussion will, uh, but uh, what's queued up is a discussion of what values we want our robocars to support. And this is intended as a mini case study of how we make moral decisions and whether our encounter with machine learning changes that. And the third step is, of course, as always, profit. So I hope to, uh, hope to see you in one of the sessions. Thanks. Thank you.